first thing I want to do in terms of lesson is to give you an overview of what these buttons and controls are, their names, just briefly introduce you to them. So as we get into the tutorial itself, you know what I'm talking about. This is your shutter button, obviously, very important. It has two phases. The first is a halfway shutter depression. This engages our camera's focusing systems. It doesn't take the picture. It's almost like a spongy resistance. Train your finger to feel that difference. It's like a spongy resistance, and when you push it all the way down, just turn on, it takes a picture. So this is what it sounds like. Camera's focusing, you can hear a beep. Push it down all the way, camera takes the picture. This is going to be critical to train your finger to feel where that focus point is, and we'll talk about different focusing methods in this video. This little guy right here is a lamp that will turn on when you are using your timer. It will also turn on in low light situations to illuminate the area, helping the camera to focus. You'll notice that we have these two little holes in the camera. These are our built-in microphones for the camera. They're not really great, but they're better than nothing. If you're doing any kind of professional video recording, you're going to want to use an external microphone, either on the hot shoe mount, plugged into the camera on the side, or a lav mic. For these videos, I use a lavalier microphone because they're clearer, the sound and the audio is better. Kind of hard to see, but down here, we have a customizable button that by default, when you get it, it's typically set up for depth of field preview. I change this to toggle through my focusing clusters. Just know that you can control what this button does. Over here, we've already talked about it. We have the lens release. Taking a look at the side view of the camera, I put a 14 to 35 wide angle lens. You'll notice that we have these different switches. If your camera stops focusing suddenly, there's a 95% chance that you did this. You just bump this switch over. This stands for autofocus, manual focus. So when you're handling the lens, sometimes that will, that will happen. You'll just bump it. And so just be aware of that. If your camera stops focusing, you probably mishandled the switch. We also have the ability to turn off, in this case, the stabilizer. The stabilizer is the image stabilization built into the lens, but also built into the camera body. So when you turn this off, it should turn it off all together, both of them. When you have a stabilized lens that works well with the in-body image stabilization, you can get some amazing, amazing shots, even hand holding the camera. That's a discussion for another lesson. Just know that there's some control switch on the side of the lenses. On the left side of the camera, we have these rubber gaskets. You can see little labels, mic, this is a headset. This is a remote USB and an HDMI. So this is the microphone port. Here it is. If we're using an external microphone, this is where we would plug it in. And if you're doing any kind of serious video work, you will definitely need a good high quality microphone. The one below it, we have the headset icon. This allows us to listen to the audio as we are recording. Highly recommended that you do that. Sometimes you'll get interference or your microphone is broken, and this will allow you to catch it before you, know, you record a bunch of stuff. Underneath here, we have a remote terminal, things like intervalometers or remote switches that allow us to control the camera by our wired remote. And then you'll notice we have this notch here to pull out. We have our USB C terminal and our HDMI out. One of the key differences of this terminal, it's still small, but this should support 6K out to an Atomos Ninja recorder. They haven't updated the firmware or the software to allow you to do this. Just know that it's probably coming. So these are the ports, very useful for shooting video, if you're using microphones and headsets. And many people ask about charging with your USB-C cable from a battery pack. Canon has an accessory that allows you to plug it into the wall and then plug it in here. You'll see a little charge lamp. If it's just a plain battery pack, it doesn't appear to be working. I think this is a power requirement, but Canon is also very finicky and touchy about non-Canon accessories being used with their camera. So they try to create these things where you have to buy more of their accessories. But yes, you can charge your camera. It just, if you look in the manual, it requires a special adapter. And I know there are workarounds that people have made and published, so I'll just leave it at that. When we look at an overhead view of the camera, obviously we have our power switch, super important. We have this new position called lock, which locks the camera settings, and we can typically customize which features are locked. We also have it in the full on position, which is also the unlocked. 
One of the key differences between the R6 Mark II and the original R6 is now we have a dedicated stills to video switch here on the left side. In terms of external buttons, this is an upgrade, I believe, because it allows us to jump into videos or stills back and forth pretty quickly. The mode dial, we'll be talking about this in depth. This controls how the camera helps us. It's how much help the camera is going to give us. If you're a pure, pure beginner, the green box is the dummy mode. I typically like beginners shooting on P or AV mode. We'll talk about this in depth a little bit later. This rolling control wheel right here is super important. And I like to refer to this as your primary selector. Primary, index finger, one. So your index finger, number one, is going to be on the primary selector. It changes the primary setting of the mode that you are shooting in. And back here, your thumb is going to rotate another wheel. And I like to call this the secondary selector, but I'll talk about why when we cover exposure control and exposure compensation. Next to the shutter button, just behind it, we have something called the MF end button or the multi-function button. It's very useful for jumping through different secondary settings, things like focusing, ISO, white balance. Talk about that in depth. We also have the video record button, which if you push this, it should start and stop video recording. This would be indicated by a little red circle on the back of your monitor. And of course, we have our strap mounts on the top sides. Real quick, I wanted to talk about the hot shoe mount. It's on top of your camera. And there's this little protector that Canon has, has put in here. And if you look carefully up towards the top here in there, you're going to see some terminal pins. So that what's happening is, is Canon's putting this little protector in there to pr protect the pins. But the problem is, is this cover is, is sometimes it'll stick. It's not exactly easy to get out. These pins here will allow you to use different kinds of accessories, including flash units. There's a new microphone that works really good. It's integrated wiring, so you don't have to plug the microphone into the side. But suffice it to say, this is your hot shoe mount. You can also put other accessories on here, like a non-pin compatible microphone or a video light, things of that nature. And that's what this is all about. We cover flash use in the crash course that we make for these cameras, just like an introduction to flash use. It's like a, about an hour part of the course and it, it'll teach you the basics to get you started. When we're talking about the back of the camera, there is a lot going on. Something I wanna point out real quick is this little dial here on the side. This is referred to as the diopter adjustment and this will control the focus of the EVF, which is the electronic viewfinder. It's a little TV in a mirrorless camera. DSLR has allowed us to look through a prism that bounced down and actually view through the lens in real time. That's not how mirrorless cameras work. We get a little TV monitor. It's going to give us exposure preview, but I wear corrective eyewear. And so I need to adjust this in order to see it clearly. Just below that, you'll see this little six dot item here. That is a little built-in speaker for the camera when you're playing back videos. In the top left-hand corner, we have a rate button, which allows us to add a rating to our images. And we have our deep menu button. There's a ton of information in the deep menu. On the back of the camera, as we grip it, we have our auto focus on. This is great for back button focusing. It's also good to set up this little star icon to eye detection. It's typically what I do. So you can get different kinds of back button focusing, depending on how you customize this. The star button by default is going to lock your exposure settings, or if you're using a flash, it will lock your flash exposure settings. So this locks the camera's shutter speed and aperture so it doesn't change and you can take a picture. This little guy here on the far right, it looks like a little box with some tick marks in it. I like to call it the focus cluster selector. By default, when you select this, it will allow you to toggle through the different types of focusing clusters. This guy here, the joystick, super important. It's going to be used for moving your focusing square around as you look through the viewfinder. And if you push it into the camera body, it will reset the focusing square to the center of the screen. Below that, we have the magnifying glass, which will allow us to zoom in on images as well as zoom in while we are shooting, especially in manual, this is super useful. We can get precise focus using manual focusing in a zoom technique that I will demonstrate. 
Pushing the info button repeatedly will allow us to cycle through different kinds of information. And then we have the Q button, quick menu, will allow us to set up different types of shutter speed, aperture, secondary controls. I'll demonstrate that in just a moment. Back here, we have the multi-selector, or the multi-control wheel. And you can see that it rotates to the left or right. In the middle, we have a set button, it's sort of like a return or an enter button. And I'll be demonstrating how this works in different aspects. Something that you'll notice is that Canon has redundancies where you can use different controls to do different things. So you might use the joystick and also be able to control, for example, net menu navigation using the primary or the secondary selector, multi-control wheel, just comes down to preference. On the bottom, we have the playback button, obviously for playing back images. And we also have the delete or the garbage can icon, which will allow us to delete images. This little lamp here, you'll see it turn red. This is writing to the memory card when it's um, buffering or caching. You'll also see this flashing in red. And this is something to be aware of. If we were to come in and start video recording, you can see that it's also flashing. When I am traveling, I typically have my monitor facing the camera just for abrasive protection. I almost always put a screen on as soon as I get it. Sometimes they're not available, but I'll put a plastic screen on this. And I'm going to rotate the monitor and flip it back around to point out a couple important things. This little window just below the EVF, if you put it up to your face or a finger or as you're handling the camera, you'll notice that it's turning the back monitor off. This is a power saving feature. And the idea behind it is that as you look through the viewfinder, EVF, let's save this battery power. And there's different ways to customize this as well. It comes in handy when you're shooting video on a gimbal. Some gimbals will have mounts here. So in the yellow menu, you can set this up in different ways. You can turn it off. Just be aware of that, that this is what's happening. This back monitor is also touch sensitive. So if we were to play the images, here we can see some images I just took in Africa, in the Masamara. We were on a conservancy. We, we watched a pride of lions literally have dinner. It was crazy. But I want, I'm doing this to demonstrate how we can use the touch screen to swipe left and right. You're used to this already, you know, with your smartphones. You can scroll through things. It, this was crazy seeing this. We, I mean, we were as close as like 20 feet from it. Another thing you can do is that you can pinch in towards the camera and you can see that we're zooming out. And this gives us a thumbnail preview. So we can scroll through these. Well, let's take a look at what's going on here. We're feeding. Okay, this is a good picture. So we can also zoom in using the magnifying button. Look at that. Just insane. It was an insane experience. Wild. Or we can just zoom in with pinching. Very quick, very intuitive. When we're in the deep menu, Section, for example, we can also touch. I think this is the fastest way to navigate is just to come in and you see I'm pushing, pushing the menu button to jump out. The, the touch screen is a very useful. We'll use it for focusing. We'll use it for a number of different ways. This really revolutionized how we operate large cameras. It's been around for several years now. Most camera companies have some sort of touch monitor on the back screen.